Good morning. Good morning. As always, we want to acknowledge to our Father and our God in heaven that we are grateful for all of his love, mercy, and blessings, and thank God that God is God and that he is God all by himself. Uh, it is not uncommon for uh, people to have good intentions but be misguided in their thinking and in their understanding. Uh, it is not even uncommon to have people have good intentions uh, but not be able to fulfill those intentions. Uh, but God never misunderstands anything, uh, nor is there anything beyond his knowledge. Uh, he has both the desire and the ability to keep uh, his promises. Thus, one of God's uh, character traits is his faithfulness. Uh, God alone has kept every promise that he has ever made, and it is God alone that works in the best interest of everyone in all that he uh, does and in all that he allows. Uh, the psalmist declared, or asked rather, in Psalm 89, 6, For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? And of course, those are rhetorical questions because only God does what God can do. Uh, but for all of God's blessings, we ought to be eternally grateful. We want to direct your attention again this morning to Genesis chapter 50, the text that was read into our hearing. We want to read again there verse number 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Based on the words here recorded by Moses in Genesis chapter 50, we want to use this morning as a subject a blessing in disguise. And as we consider the text that we have before us here in Genesis chapter 50, uh, let me say that my title is somewhat of a misnomer. Uh, and, and I say that because, number one, there is more than one blessing articulated in this account. And moreover, I'm of the mind that it's not so much that God disguises blessings, as it is that we don't see what God sees and we don't know what God knows. And so it's often in retrospect that we appreciate what God is doing. Now, what he intended as a blessing was a blessing all along. It just took us some time to figure out what God was doing. Let us also appreciate about blessings that while many of God's blessings may move us to smile, God is also able to bless us with things that may move us to tears. In James 1, verses 2 through 4, James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, when James talks about falling into various trials, he's not talking about pleasant situations. Uh, when he talks about having uh, uh, your faith tested, uh, you, you ever have somebody that just uh, uh, put your faith to the test? I mean, they just try your patience. That, that's usually not a pleasant situation either, but James says a blessing may come out of that situation. When we read the Bible and as we consider uh, uh, the family of Jacob here in Genesis chapter 50, it's easier as we read the Bible to see God working from the perspective of retrospect. But it's more challenging to appreciate his work from the perspective of real time. When we read the Genesis account and we look back at what is going on, I believe we're of the mind telling Joseph, just hang in there with God. He, he's going to work it out in the end. 
But, but it's a little different as I'm living life in real time and I'm in the heat of the moment being of the mind that God has everything under control and I just need to hold uh, uh, to his unchanging hand. But let us bear in mind uh, the directive of scripture is not to attempt to anticipate God's providence. In, in other words, it's not our job to try to figure out how God is going to work it out before he works it out. Uh, our job is to be faithful to God while he is working it out. The directive of scripture is to trust God's faithfulness. Uh, again, in your Bibles, in 1 Peter 4 and verse number 19, Peter says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good, as to a faithful creator. Now, Peter is saying, and there are going to be times when you go through stuff, but don't forget the God to whom you belong and the God to uh, whom you serve. Be faithful to him and allow him to do what he does uh, as you go through life. Because when we attempt to anticipate how God will work, we may be wrong in what we think. And you know what happens when you try to think for somebody else and then you're wrong? Now we're upset, we're, we're discouraged, we have a problem. When, when nobody said that's how it's going to be, that's just how I thought it was going to work out. Uh, you remember Naaman? Naaman was wrong in his thinking about the way God would heal him. And, and remember, Naaman had in mind what God ought to do. But when he got down there to Elijah, God had a different plan in mind. And remember, Naaman was angry. It, it, you ought not work this way. Look, I, I'm a dignitary. I, I, I'm a commander in the army. I, I'm used to folk treating me a certain way. Well, well, God had a different plan in mind. And until Naaman got on board with God's plan, he remained a leper. Abraham's thinking concerning Isaac being offered as a sacrifice was off the mark. You remember Abraham thought, well, I, I, I'll kill him a, a, as a sacrifice and God will just raise him back to life. Uh, well, God had something different in mind. Uh, our lot is to obey what God has commanded and, and not try to figure out how God is going to do what he does. So when we look here at Genesis chapter 50, and uh, as we consider the life of Joseph, Joseph was no stranger to adversity. Now, to my mind of thinking, it's one thing to bring adversity on yourself. You know, I, I can look back over my life and say, you know what, I asked for that one. You know, if, if you tooling down 95 and you're doing 85 in the fast lane, and the trooper pulls you over and gives you a ticket for speeding, well, you ask for that one. You know, ain't no need in getting mad talking about this other criminals out here worse than me. Well, that might be the case, but you committing a crime, and if he gives you a ticket, pay the fine and slow down. You got what you had coming. In my mind, is one thing when I bring trouble on myself. Uh, uh, in Luke 29, uh, uh, 23 rather, verses 39 through 41, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Now, think about it. You're a criminal. You're being crucified for that reason. But notice what he says to Jesus. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Well, well if I am the Christ, why would I save you? I don't owe you anything. I don't even know you. You're trying to save your own skin, but you and I have really nothing in common. But then watch verse 40. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly? Now see, that first thief says, see, we brought it on ourselves. We getting punished for what we did. We received the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. It's one thing to bring adversity on yourself, but it's more of a challenge uh, to suffer when it seems the adversity is unwarranted. Uh, you remember Job, Job 31, 35 through 37. Job says, Oh, that I had one to hear me, 
Here is my mark. Now, now to us, mark would be a signature. Job says, I'm willing to sign uh, uh, how I feel about what I'm going through. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me that my prosecutor had written a book. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it on me like a crown. Job is saying, I'm willing to be accountable and assume responsibility for the life I've lived. Uh, now, you have to appreciate his friends kept, you know, dealing with him based on this misguided theology. His friends operated from the standpoint, number one, God punishes sinners and rewards the wicked. Number two, Job, you are suffering. Number three, therefore, Job, you must be a sinner. Now, they were dead wrong in what they thought. And Job, in answering him, Job says, look, I I'm willing to stand up and, and be accountable for the life that I live. I I'm not trying to hide behind a, a, a false profession of righteousness. But then watch what he says in verse 37. I would declare to him the number of my steps. Now, who's going to tell God anything? Job said, look, I, I talk to God. I'm ready to talk turkey. I know that I've lived right before him. But then he says in verse, uh, uh, the end of verse 37, like a prince, I would approach him. Now, appreciate, in the absence of understanding and knowledge of God's working, Job struggled with the reason for his sufferings. Now, again, his friends were just dead wrong. Job, you, you must be a sinner. But that last phrase in verse 37 is one that Job is confident in his innocence. Now, I appreciate Hebrews 4.16 tells us, let us come boldly before the throne of grace. But that's not because we're innocent. That's because we have Jesus as our high priest. But Job says, like a prince, I would approach him. Now, if I had to come before God... You know, I, I, I come before God kind of like Agag came before Samuel. You remember uh, 1 Samuel 15 when God told Saul to kill everybody and everything, but he spared King Agag and, uh, uh, and the best of what the Amalekites had. Uh, and, and God tells Samuel to finish what Saul should have done. And Samuel calls Agag and Agag says, surely the bitterness of death is past. Now, they've killed a lot of things, but they spared me thus far. Agag said, I'm, I'm hoping they'll keep on sparing me. And, and the Bible says he came uh, to Samuel softly. You know, he came kind of hat in hand. He ain't come one of them eyeballing Sa uh, Samuel like, what you going to do to me? Sam, uh, uh, Agag came, understood it, and he understood my life is in the balance here. And so he came softly, but Job says, like a prince, I would approach him. Job says, I'm not fooling. I know I'm innocent, and I'm even willing to stand before God on the basis of the life I've lived. Well, now, when we think about Joseph and Job, two men who suffered, uh, 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 we could say, and, and their suffering was unwarranted, even as God had a plan in the lives of Joseph and Job, God also has a plan for us. You know, God always has a plan. God never operates on the fly, just, just trying to figure out things as he goes. God always has a plan. When you look back and read the Old Testament, even when his people were going through something, God had a plan. He had a plan for Israel in allowing them to be carried away uh, uh, as slaves in, in Babylon. In Jeremiah 29, verses 10 and 11, For thus says the Lord, After seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. See, that's God saying, I have a plan. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a, fu a future and a hope. But what we have to appreciate is God's plan is not necessarily our plan. And if we tell the truth, we don't always like God's plan when we hear it. Now, God tells Israel, after 70 years are completed at Babylon. Now, this is God's plan. It's going to take 70 years for you to get to the blessing. Now, can you imagine if you one year old when God reveals the plan? 
I'm going to be 71 by the time the blessing comes, which means I'm going to go from being an infant well into senior citizenry before the blessing ever comes. That's God's plan. Look, it doesn't revolve around you. This is the plan that I have in mind. And appreciate in everything that we face, God has a plan. And he doesn't ask us to sign off on it before he puts the plan in motion. The Genesis account declares to us that not only did God have a plan, but he was also working on multiple levels in the execution of his plan. You know, we can be very me-centered in our thinking. When we think about what's going on, Lord, I want you to bless me. Lord, this is what I am going through. What we fail to realize is every day God is dealing with some 8 billion people all the time, every day. And my life is a little speck uh, on, on, on the page of the world. So as God is working, it's not just me that's involved in his workings. God is working with me, but he's also working with uh, uh, 8 billion other people uh, all at once. Now, when we look at Genesis chapter 50, again, verse 20, but as for me, or rather, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day to save many people alive. I submit to you, number one, that God was working to prepare Joseph. Whenever stuff is going on in your life, it's not about the stuff that's going on. It's about what God is working on uh, as it pertains to me, or, or maybe it's not even about me. Maybe God is working through me to, to help somebody else. But time and again in Scripture, we see where God prepared his servants for service, uh, his servants for service before he deployed them to serve. If you think about Moses, arguably one of the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest servant in, in the Old Testament, Moses tended the flock of his father-in-law, and he was in Midian 40 years before God used him to lead uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, he's in Midian 40 years tending sheep. I suspect Moses learned a lesson or two about leadership those 40 years uh, in Midian. David was a shepherd before he became king over God's people. I just think it's interesting that God used being a shepherd before he put uh, different people in leadership positions. He'd probably say uh, sheep are, are, are a lot like people. If you watch some sheep, uh, you know, then when you deal with people, you're not so surprised. You know, they just like sheep. In fact, doesn't the Bible liken us to sheep? Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd and, and you all are, are the sheep. Now, as God is preparing us, and God had a plan to use Joseph uh, as second in command in Egypt, but before he was suited to serve, there was some preparation that he needed. Now, appreciate as God prepares us for things, uh, that God's preparation can be difficult. In, in Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, though he was a son, or even though he was a son, speaking concerning Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Do you know part of the reason Jesus came down here in the flesh? He needed some preparation to serve before he was suited for service. Notice what, what, what the Hebrew writer says in verse 9. And having been perfected, now it's not talking about him being sinless, he was always sinless. But he needed some preparation in order to be the Savior. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Well, well, in what way did he need some preparation? I need to understand what you all go through in order to be your Savior. So you all won't be walking around here talking about, you don't understand what it's like. Don't we fall back to that? You don't know what it's like. To have people turn on you. Y yes, Jesus did because he had it happen to him. You don't know what it's like. To, to, you think you can count on people and you can't count on. He knows that too. In fact, whatever we've gone through, he went through first. Remember, he was even tempted by Satan. 
Uh, so uh, look, there's there no temptation that we go through that, that he hadn't felt some kind of way. And remember, one of the temptations, uh, he had been fasting 40 days. And Satan says, if you are God's son, turn these stones to bread. Now, he could have did that. He could have turned them stones to bread with, with, by speaking the word. But when you and I are in extremities, when we have needs, we can't just speak a word and boom, the, the need is met. Anybody here, you ever been short on your rent? And, and look, you don't even take stones. You, just, you get some Monopoly money. And, and you can change that Monopoly money into real money. I, I think if we could do that, man, all of us would be driving a Lexus or better. We have to depend on God. Well, what did Jesus have to do? He had to live depending on God to be suited to be our Savior. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, obey him. But appreciate some of that preparation was difficult. Which leads us to the question, what preparation did Joseph need? Well, I submit to you that one that is entrusted with power over people must know something about forgiveness lest he become a tyrant. You know, when you have power over people, you can get even with folk. You can mistreat folk if they've mistreated you. You can mistreat them just because you don't like them. When you look at Joseph's experience in growing up, the dysfunction in Joseph's family was used by God to prepare Joseph for service. Now remember, God had a plan all along. Joseph tells us there in Genesis 50 verse 20, this was part of God's plan. But if you back up as Joseph is growing up in Genesis 37, verse four, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. And, you know, Jacob was just blatant with his favoritism. He 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 gets a coat for Joseph and, and the other 11 brothers don't get anything. Can you imagine that your birthday roll around and here you get a nice gift and everybody else's birthday, they don't get anything. It was clear Joseph was his favorite. You remember when Jacob was uh, uh, about to meet Esau and he thought Esau might do him some harm? Guess who he put at the very back in the safest position? Joseph. And he put the other brothers out front where, look, if Esau is mad, he'll get them first. Joseph might get away. So the Bible says when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now that's a major dysfunction. When your own brothers can't speak peaceably to you. And, and I submit to you, if they can't speak peaceably to you, they don't treat you peaceably either. You know, I, I suspect when they look at you, you, you can see the malice in their eyes when they look at you. I, I would imagine if Joseph was going out the tent and one of his brothers was coming in the tent, uh, they bumped him and it wasn't by accident and bumped him hard. And this was the norm in that family. See, when folk dislike you, they don't just dislike you right now. They, don't, they dislike you all the time. His brothers hated him and could not speak to him uh, uh, peaceably. Now, you wanna see just how much they hated him. In verse 18, now when they, Joseph's brothers, saw him, Joseph, afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Now, let me tell you, when you're going to murder somebody, that, that's, you, you, that's a powerful form of hatred when you're ready to murder somebody. And this, their own brother. Genesis 37, verse 28, we find out now, you need to go back and read, read all of Genesis, but in, in particular, chapter 37, if you want to know. I'm, I'm grabbing some highlights as we go, kind of giving you the Cliff Notes version. Well, one of the brothers decide, you know, we, we can't kill him. He's our brother. We, we, we don't want that kind of blood on our hand, and ain't, ain't no money in that anyhow. Let's sell him. And we get rid of him and make a few bucks on top of it. Uh, Genesis 37, verse 28, Then Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit. See, they had thrown him in the pit. They were going to kill him. And sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Now, let me tell you something. Selling Joseph into this kind of slavery, by all accounts, was a death sentence in and of itself. 
Because if they took you and put you in one of them salt mines, you wasn't going to be around for long. So they was getting rid of them, but let, look, let's make a few bucks. And then they lied to their daddy about what happened to him. They took his coat, you know, the, the coat that he was the only one to get a gift, and dipped it in animal blood and, and told their daddy that ant, wild animals had killed him. Now, Genesis 42, 21 tells us that Joseph begged for his life. He begged them not to sell him uh, uh, as a slave. Well, now, he's dealt with all of that drama. When he gets to Egypt, uh, Potiphar you know, buys him. He ends up a servant in Potiphar's house. He was propositioned by Potiphar's wife. And when he refused her advances, she falsely accused him of attempted rape. Now, you, man, life just went from bad to worse. Cause now, let me tell you, Potiphar's wife has accused him. Now, he's a foreigner in Egypt. And Potiphar is a big wheel in Egypt. Now, the big wheel's wife has accused me of rape. Now, ain't no trial there to try to figure out what happened. If she said you tried to rape her, you tried to rape her. Well, now, rape is a capital offense. But the Bible says when Potiphar heard this, he was angry and he had Joseph put in prison. Now, when the Bible says Potiphar was angry, and this is this just my take on it, but when the Bible says Potiphar was angry, I don't think Potiphar was angry with Joseph. Because if you really believe he tried to rape your wife, yeah, having him executed is what you would do. When it says Potiphar was angry, I think Potiphar was angry at Mrs. Potiphar because I'm about to lose my best servant because you done accused him of trying to rape you. And mind you, I know who I'm married to. See, I, don't, I suspect Joseph might not have been the first person she tried to put the moves on. So Potiphar is angry because I'm losing a good... Man, God has been blessing me because of Joseph. And now you come in here with this story and I'm getting ready to lose him. Now, that's just my take on it. You, you may not agree with that, but that, that, that's what I get when I read the text. So he's put in prison. Well, in prison, he meets a butler and a baker. Well, he interprets the dreams for the butler and the baker, and the butler is actually restored to his position. Now, having helped the chief butler, you know, Joseph just says to him, now, when you get your position back, just remember to look out for me because I interpreted your dream. Well, the Bible tells us that the butler proceeded to forget about him for two years. So he spends two more years in prison before the butler finally decides to say, hey, I know somebody that can interpret dreams. Well, when Joseph rises to power, it's within his power to get even with everybody that has wronged him. I can get even with my brothers. I can get even with Mrs. Potiphar. Potiphar, I don't know. I, I might show you some grace because you did have me thrown in prison, but she kind of put you in a position where you had to do something. I might let Potiphar slide. I can also get even with this, uh, with, with this butler for forgetting about me for two years. But see, power is not given to be wielded for revenge. God had something bigger in mind for Joseph. And Joseph says as much in verse 20. You meant it for evil, but God had a plan. See, I, I've got to be faithful to God. I can't use my position to get even with folk. That, that, that's not being a good leader. That's not being a faithful servant of God. So God was working to prepare Joseph. But not only was he working to prepare Joseph, but God was working to reconcile Jacob's family. Now remember, Joseph is Jacob's son. And it's easy to read Genesis and be a critical analyst of all the problems that existed uh, in Jacob's house. But the real benefit uh, uh, of, bi of studying the Bible is not when I'm a critical expert in everybody else's problem. The best inspection is introspection. When, when, when I look and say, how does this apply to me? How can I be better based on what the word of God says? There was a great deal of dysfunction in Jacob's family, but I would venture that every family knows some measure of dysfunction. Now, I know we know how to come down here to the building and say the right things and, 
and, and look right and, and, and all of that. But, you know, sometimes we tell on ourselves. You, you, you just watch folk and you can see sometimes there's some dysfunction going on in that house. Now, now, I'm not an expert in what's going on, but I can tell by watching y'all, everything in that house isn't what it ought to be. Now, recall from Genesis 37, verse 4, where the Bible said his brothers hated him and couldn't even speak peaceably to him. Joseph's brothers had a strong hatred of him. But if you keep reading uh, uh, chapter 37, in particular, verse 5 and, and, and also verse 8, his brother said to him, see, Joseph had this dream, and he tells him, I had this dream, and so the interpretation of the dream, I'm going to become y'all's master. Y'all going to bow down to me. Now, they already don't like you. What in the world would possess you to tell them that you're going to be in a position of superiority? So their reaction is, shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. You hate him more, you already hate him that you can't even speak peaceably to him. And now you hate him more. But Joseph's dream comes to fruition. That's where we are in, in chapter 50. And now his brothers fear that Joseph may seek revenge. If you look there in Genesis 50 verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. You know, it's interesting how we can tell on ourselves when we talk about ourselves. Perhaps Joseph will hate us and repay us for all the evil that we did to him. They admit, look, we were wrong. We, and we did him wrong. And now he might get even. I believe that at least part of the issue uh, in the text with Joseph's brothers is that we tend to ascribe our own feelings and thoughts to others. I, I think the brothers looked at this thing and they said, if it was me and I was second in command in Egypt and y'all had treated me the way we treated you, if, if I had, you know, the ability to get even, I sure enough would. So they figured because they would, Maybe Joseph will, too. And I think they make up this story. Before daddy died, he said, forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin for the evil they did to you. Now, number one, why did daddy just tell me that while he was living? How is it he told y'all and y'all hold on to it until he's dead to tell me? Now, appreciate Joseph's brothers are not beyond making up stories. They lied to their daddy about what happened to Joseph. And well, if you lied to daddy, why wouldn't they lie to Joseph? Daddy said, be nice to us, even though we weren't so nice to you. Now, if Joseph wanted revenge, he could have gotten even with them as far back as chapter 42. Remember, they came down to Egypt looking for food because there was a famine. If Joseph just wanted to get even, he could have got them then. He had them dead to rights. Jacob could have said what he said. And if he really said that, he could have said it directly to Joseph. I, I, I think they're making this up. But Joseph, if you look at it now from the brother's perspective, Joseph is in a position where reconcili reconciliation is the right thing, but it's also in their best interest because he's second in command in Egypt. See, we hated you to where we couldn't even speak peaceably to you and sold you into slavery thinking you would die a slave. Somehow you ended up second in command in Egypt. It's just in our best interest to play nice. Because now you got the ability to get even with us. Joseph says, am I in the place of God? See, God didn't raise me to second in command to get even with y'all. Y'all thinking on way too small a scale and you thinking wrong. God had something bigger in mind than just getting even with y'all. God wanted to reconcile this family. 
Which leads me to the last conclusion. Not only was God working to reconcile Jacob's family, but God was working to preserve lives. Through all the drama and dysfunction, God worked to preserve Joseph and his family. But consider that God worked to preserve not just the lives of, Joseph's, uh, uh, of Jacob's family members. In a larger context, God was working to fulfill the promise to Abraham, which has implications for all humanity. In Genesis 26, 4, God says to Abraham, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And what God is saying to Abraham is, the Christ, the Messiah, is going to be your descendant. Well, guess who else was Abraham's descendant? Jacob, Joseph, and all his brothers. So God says, I, I'm going to save that family because I made a promise to Abraham. And in saving that family, I'm also going to save the world. God was operating on a much larger scale than they could anticipate. See, it's not about the wrong that y'all did to Joseph. And mind you, you did do him wrong. But God was working on a much bigger scale than they could appreciate. Which says to us, I ought not ever restrict the work of God to just my life. You know, the situations that are going on, they might just be bigger than me. God might be using my life because my life is intertwined with the lives of other people. And what I'm going through may not even be about me. Was it about Joseph? Well, to some degree it was, but guess what, Joseph? I'm using you in a bigger plan. It's not just about what your brothers did to you. It's about me keeping the promise to Abraham to bless all of humanity by having Jesus be one of his descendants. Well, as we go through life, I, we all face some adversity, some hardships, some ups and downs, but it might just be a blessing in disguise. It might be that God has a plan, that God is working on something, but because I don't see what God sees and I don't know what God knows, that I'm not able to appreciate what God is doing. But I can always trust God's faithfulness because being in control of the universe is God's job. My job is just to be faithful to him. And through that promise that God made to Abraham, and he kept the promise, and all the world is blessed because Jesus died as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Now, we are not saved just because Jesus died, but we certainly have the blessing and the privilege of being saved because he died. Now, God requires that we hear the good news, uh, the good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried but raised the third day for our justification. That's the gospel in a nutshell. God requires that we hear the gospel message, Romans 10:17. Having heard the gospel message, we must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John 8, verse 24. Because we believe, we must be willing to repent of our past sins, uh, Luke 13, 3, Luke 13, 5. We must make the confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, verse 37. And then as an act of obedience to the command of God, we must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. When we go down into the waters of baptism as an obedient response to the command of God, in the waters of baptism, God washes away our sins by the blood of Christ Jesus, puts his spirit inside of us, and adds us to the church. And when we come up out of the waters of baptism, his command, his will, is that we live faithfully in his service uh, for the rest of our living. Revelation 2, verse 10. 
If you're listening to this broadcast via one of the social media outlets, you want to be baptized into Christ Jesus, then we bid you reach out to our elders at elders at laurelchurch.net. Uh, they will be happy to make provision for you to be baptized into Christ Jesus. If you're here in our audience and this is your desire, then we bid you to come as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation. Hi, this is Ricky Cook, one of the ministers here at the Laurel Church of Christ. We're glad you've chosen to watch our video broadcast. We'd also like to invite you to join us for in-person worship. We have worship services at 8 a.m. and another at 1030 a.m. every Sunday morning. We also have a worship service in Spanish at 1 p.m. Sunday afternoons. Bible class is on Sunday at 930 a.m. And on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have Bible class in both English and Spanish. Please know that you're always welcome here. We look forward to seeing you.